in KubeCon. I've been doing announcements all day, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, it was super awesome to have this community, it is super awesome because we still have another day, to have this community together and uh, seeing so much invigorated discussion about all the things that are going on today. So we have an opportunity here this afternoon to talk to uh, a lot of people who have a long and storied history in open source, by which I am not calling them old or myself old, to be clear, but a long and storied history in open source and working with open, broad open source communities and uh, foundations. So I'm going to ask the panelist to, the panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about the uh, foundation or project that they're working with and how that project intersects with the Kubernetes community today. So, Diane, could you introduce yourself? Sure, and thank you everybody for coming and listening to this talk on community and contribution because by the end of it, you'll all want to be contributors to our projects. That's my goal for being here. My name is Diane Mueller. I work for Red Hat. I'm the community lead and community manager for OpenShift. And if you don't know OpenShift yet, yet come to our booth. But OpenShift upstreams Kubernetes and Docker and a number of other projects too. And one of um, what we have for a community model is called the OpenShift Commons. And we have a, a large ecosystem. About 35 com companies so far have contributed code to OpenShift, including Google. Um, but what we are really looking to do is to build communities around the entire ecosystem. And we have about 185 organizations that are part of our community. Um, all of those people are now using Kubernetes. So we are huge implementers and deployments of Kubernetes test beds for your, your code and your contribution. So it's a very nice channel for you to reach into um, the, the OpenShift community if you have things that you'd like to test and test out in Kuber Kubernetes because that's basically um, part of the meat of our OpenShift um, deployment this month. Excellent, thank you. And hey guys, this is Michael. I'm working for uh, Juniper Networks and I'm really excited to be here today and talk about um, our software-defined networking solution, which is um, Open Contrail. Um, Open Contrail, I mean, Juniper, most people, of most people might see Juniper as a um, network hardware vendor and Open Contrail was basically one of the first real core products we went open source with. And, um, this was not only a challenge for the community, but it was also a challenge for the company itself because, um, I mean, if you run closed source for a while, for nearly 10 years, and then you're starting to open source something, it's uh, quite some challenge, uh, to say at least. However, um, we managed to get a great community together um, on the open control stuff, so we implemented a um, advisory board, which consists mainly of um, developers, users, who are actively um, pushing code and pushing ideas to open control. And um, with Kubernetes, I think um, what we found out is that open control is a perfect platform to provide micro segmentation. And this fits perfectly into what um, Kubernetes does with um, containers today. So um, we are in doors and we really welcome every single developer to um, provide ideas to help to evolve um, the product for the future so that we can make um, all the microservices a little bit better and that we can provide a um, really seamless networking experience to all the um, container implementations. Thierry. Hello. Um, so my name is Thierry Carrez. I'm the director of engineering at the OpenStack Foundation, which basically translates into uh, making sure that the upstream part of the project is working well. So the open source project, the open collaboration that we've built uh, uh, around, around OpenStack is working well. And I'm um, here this week mostly to explain how the two communities are actually complementary and also to share the experience we had with uh, setting up the open collaboration around OpenStack for, uh, for reuse for the Kubernetes community as it gets more and more open. Excellent. And Alexis. We, so we heard from Alexis this morning, so we'll get more on this. Do I need to push the button? No. Just, just hold it Hi, up near your mouth. My name is Alexis Richardson. Closer. I am I'm here for two reasons. I'm the chairman of the technical committee for CNCF, which is where Kubernetes now lives. 
So, hooray. <laughs> um, if you have questions about that or want to discuss issues around that, this is the time to do that, and also tomorrow on the CNCF There panel. will be another panel about the CNCF uh, tomorrow yep. afternoon as well. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of WeaveWorks, which has a different contributions policy from CNCF. Happy to talk about that too. <laughs> Excellent. And <coughs> I introduced myself a bit this morning, but I will go ahead again. I'm Sarah Novotny, and I work for Google as the program manager for a uh, community <coughs> around uh, <coughs> Kubernetes. And my hope is that uh, we find from this, as I said, storied group, lots of ideas about how the Kubernetes community can continue to grow and foster more innovation. So who wants to jump in and talk about how they're involved in the Kubernetes today? Diane, jumping well, in. <laughs> well, I'll start off. One of the, th the wonderful things about Kubernetes and, and what we've been doing with it at Red Hat is the cross-community collaboration. So if there's things for us in OpenShift that we need in Kubernetes, mm -hmm. instead of just asking for it, we've been putting engineers directly, <coughs> excuse me, directly here, directly into the Kubernetes project to work on it. So you'll see not just Red Hat, but Mesos, lots of people working directly in there. And that's really, I think, the model that's been working very nicely for Kubernetes and for OpenShift itself. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? How you're yeah, well, yes. um, I mean, if people starting to deploy uh, mass scale Kubernetes type of environments, um, you will see that there will be pretty much different requirements on network infrastructures mm -hmm. compared with uh, today's uh, needs, especially if you compare to legacy network environments, if you compare it even to um, standard virtualized environments, if it's on OpenStack or if it's on VMware. And um, this is going to change the requirements on how networks have to work. And that's where we need input from the community on how we can make the network to provide a better micro segmentation and how a network can help to support um, all that little containers running around. So that's why Juniper and um, the Open Control team is really asking um, the community to provide ideas on how to provide, for example, better segmentation between pods, how to translate and to abstract things like network policies. And um, yeah, that's basically where we are asking for help from the community on how we can support the network to have a better um, infrastructure layer for containers. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Jerry? Yeah, so my goal is to make sure that OpenStack can be used as an infrastructure provider for Kubernetes. Currently, uh, we have addressed that problem with a number of projects within OpenStack, which basically deploy Kubernetes uh, on top of OpenStack resources. But uh, I think there is there is a value addition to Kubernetes to be able to auto deploy to a number of infrastructure providers. And what I want to make sure is that OpenStack is one of those uh, um, turnkey infrastructure providers that you could basically from Kubernetes. Uh, um, deploy de deploy your Kubernetes cluster on top of OpenStack resources, and that creates a number of challenges for us as well, because um, like every OpenStack cloud currently is slightly different, and that makes for a very bad user experience. That makes for a very hard um, 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 uh, project within Kubernetes if you want to support every OpenStack cloud. So Rackspace is currently. Uh, supported as one first-class citizen within the Kubernetes community, I want to replace that white space thing by an OpenStack thing, which would work on any OpenStack cloud. And we have work to do on our side. We want to make sure that we interact well with the, uh, the Kubernetes community to make sure that when they push those features in, they also support OpenStack as an infrastructure yeah. provider. We've recently started an OpenStack Kubernetes SIG, a special interest group about people that are interested in, in OpenStack and Kubernetes in combination. Um, we also have, I, I'm going to just kind of pop in, we also have a networking special interest group. For those of you who have specific interests in um, first class providers, of, for example, OpenStack, we also have AWS and uh, Azure is getting started. We're bringing, we're trying to bring these communities together, of course. And I suspect networking is going to be Alexis's point of entry for the Kubernetes community as well. Really? Oh, well, we've worked. I couldn't. Maybe so I'm, maybe I'm out on, lim on a limb here. Let me say some things about networking. Because <laughs> it's so, so much fun. <laughs> um, 
here's how we're working with the networking, uh, sorry, the Kubernetes community. Um, speaking as a WeaveWorks person now. Um, so Docker tried to do this thing called Lib Network, which was designed to be an interface for other networking providers to interface with Docker so that enterprise customers could run Docker and run their own choice of network uh, seamlessly. This proved to be difficult. So we started working with Coros and then VMware and Calico and then everybody else to do something called CNI. This is the common network interface and this has become the Kubernetes plugin model. This collaboration worked extremely well. Uh, it was very fast to deliver software and now there is a really good Kubernetes network plugin model, which you should all use. Hooray. <laughs> yes. This actually is a template for how collaboration should work. Um, I don't know if the CNCF will be the home for this uh, particular set of interfaces and code in the future. Probably is the answer. Uh, it may also become the home for something like Docker Lib Network. Maybe, maybe they will converge. But um, the main thing is that what we want is that the, the people who are not vendors, um, what we like to think of as everyone else, become involved now and start to say, this is what we want from networking. This is what we want for Kubernetes. But also, this is what we want for containers. You know, what if you're not running Kubernetes? What if you're just running Docker or run C? Please tell us what you want. So collaboration isn't just about vendors getting together. It's also about people who are end users saying, hang on a second, this use case is not important to me. This is important because if you don't do that, uh, vendors can get kind of get out of control. They get really excited about uh, enterprise requirements. So you'll have people saying, this thing needs to have a really complex security model. They will never say that, but actually that is the subtext. It's like watching Annie Hall was like a subtitle. I think we need to have policy. What that really means is the security model is not complicated enough. We must collaborate to make it much more difficult to understand. So please get involved in that. Before it gets too complicated. Before it gets, yes. Please don't get involved after it gets complicated. Please get involved before it gets complicated. And in terms of other involvement in the community and the question, um, you know, on the Kubernetes front, uh, today we announced that Kubernetes is part of the Cloud Native Foundation. It's actually moving to a stage which we call the incubation stage. Mm -hmm. This is something we borrowed from Apache. It's a pretty standard idea. The idea is that it's a holding pattern while you figure out some details. What we need really badly is for everybody in the Kubernetes community who wants to have a say to now step forward and talk about what they expect in terms of governance. Now, the philosophy of the Cloud Native Foundation on governance is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Which is great news for the Kubernetes community because there had been some fears and concerns about moving to the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. That's right. Please don't be frightened. We're here to help. I mean, seriously, <laughs> the, the idea of the, the CNCF is, is to provide a, a service to open source projects, not to intervene. So tell us what you need. That's very, very, very important. Especially given the very nascent stage of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, we as a Kubernetes community have an opportunity to help shape this and make it that much easier for the next projects to be onboarded and have specific offers of help available. Yeah. That's right. And this applies not, not only to Kubernetes, but also to other projects. Yeah. So please, if you are involved with another open source project and you're looking to adopt a foundation way of doing things for any reason, come and talk to us and tell us exactly why uh, you would need help, because we want to provide that help. Uh, okay? uh, and I think one of the other things people, if you haven't been watching the Kubernetes project closely, it ain't broke. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of companies already with commit and maintainer privileges outside of Google. So if you take a look at that, um, it's, and it's not just Red Hat, um, there, this, it's been a very open, openly governed in some sense already project. So trying to figure out how to put that into words and practices will be part of the challenge of the CNCF. As well as, as, well as growing better practices so that yeah. we can give a roadmap to someone who wants to become a contributor. For example, right now, that's not a very clear process. So finding ways and working with uh, potentially the CNCF to define what might be a standard way going forward. Thierry. And to go back to what Diane said, mm -hmm. the in any open source foundation, you have two sides. 
the downstream side, which is like pulling all the marketing resources and 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 mm. have everyone pulling in the same direction, and the upstream side, which is the protection of the open source project, making sure it's independent and and act as an open collaboration ground for multiple parties to be involved. The downstream side is actually quite easy to get because everyone knows how to make a trade association, how to run a summit, how to um, to throw events and pool marketing resources. The upstream side, you have multiple options, and that's where uh, you need to to pick a few uh, principles and and see where where that leads you. So that's an interesting place to be to um, start modeling this upstream side of things. Um, one of the things about the CNCF is that we will be consulting with the OpenStack Foundation to learn <laughs> what principles to choose and what didn't work. What, what worked <laughs> and what did not work. Yes. And the Apache Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation and everybody else. Well, uh, at so least one of our TOC members is uh, a t Apache Foundation um, project lead, too. That's why I said at least one. Yeah. See, I can count. At least one. There is uh, Camille <laughs> Fournier, who is the um, one of the people in the Zookeeper team, and uh, Ben Hindman, who is, I think, believe the founder of the oh. Apache Mesos project. Yes. Mm. Yep. So we have a lot to learn from other foundations and intend to take it very seriously. Mm. All right. Do we have any more comments on sort of this one at the moment? All right. We will get to questions from the audience, I swear. I'm trying to lay some foundation here. Um, so you all have in front of you a lot of Kubernetes users, a lot of Kubernetes developers, people really invested in the community and engagement um, with this project. What do you want to know from them? How can they help you? Well, I, I guess I'll go first. Uh, I just uh, led a wonderful session by John Mulhausen uh, yes. on documentation. Hi, John. Thank you. <laughs> you are a small god. Um, I think w all of us would agree that uh, the Kubernetes documentation up until now has been driven by engineering, and we at Red Hat know what that's all about. Um, and we have a huge opportunity now to really up the game for Kubernetes documentation and get um, the ease of use and the installation guides um, in there. And I would ask everyone to take a look at that project and try and help that initiative move forward. Um, from a, an OpenShift selfish point of view, um, we have a lot of requests about service linking and service catalogs, so we can make that available. So you'll see um, some pull requests and conversations around that happening now. I'd love to get more eyeballs and use cases on that. So if you're interested in that sort of work, um, talk to me afterwards. Okay, I'm going to interrupt before we go to someone else because I want to uh, reiterate the, the documentation pr um, point. If you didn't get to see John's talk uh, just an hour ago, um, the 1.2, as of 1.2, the documentation and the Kubernetes.io website have been moved out into their own separate repository, which, which anyone can make pull requests against in a nice, clean, discreet way um, that makes it a lot more accessible for us as a community to engage with and contribute to and improve. So uh, the, I've been told that the team here uh, that is doing videos at Skills Matter is stellar about getting our videos up really quick. So I won't promise you a timeline, but I've heard rumors that it might be within 48 hours. So you'll be able to see John's talk uh, over the weekend potentially. I won't promise, as I said. But OK, so one of you, uh, you jumped in a little bit with this before, Michael. So yeah, please continue. Exactly. I mean, I talked about that before. So um, what, what I would like to know from the community is, what are your main pain points in, in terms of networking for Kubernetes? And not only Kubernetes, because um, Open Contrail is basically a SDN layer which can stretch across Kubernetes, Docker, VMware, OpenStack, bare metal, legacy networks. So if you're not talking about today, but tomorrow, next year, two year time frame, three year time frame, if you're talking about things like um, IoT, whatsoever, what are you looking forward in terms of networking? What are the features you're dreaming of? And please don't be shy with that because um, it's an open development in open control, so we will look at any type of request. 
Um, thing is, Open Control is heavily focused on networking. So, I mean, we can do quite a lot. We can provide good integration with physical networks. We can provide good integration with um, any type of um, orchestration manager. But we need input. We need to know where we can have new developments, where we can have um, new um, exciting features in the networking stack. But that's something where we need input from the community. I'm going to guess that he wants to be on every one of those tweets, pull requests, <laughs> and emails, or someone from the WaveWorks team. Maybe I won't. Here's the feature that we're looking for from networking: is that you don't need to care about it at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's <laughs> a very, very good point. Because I mean, that's that's one of the um, things we are providing today with the um, implementation. We have abstracted um, <coughs> the compli the complicated definition of things like virtual networks, IP addresses, network policies, in a way that it's fairly easy for a developer just to um, rely on labels, to, to use a name for a new virtual network, to um, use the use tag to connect services, to connect pods to each other. And I mean, that is one thing I think we got out of the community, but um, I guess there will be more in the future. So what I want to get out of the Kubernetes community is use cases, real life experiences, to see where uh, OpenStack can fit or not fit within the, within your workloads. It's not for everyone. Um, so in which cases it would make sense? Is, if you're running a Kubernetes cluster, is it is it the only thing you have? Do you have other needs? That type of stuff to see uh, how the, the two projects can be as complementary as possible. Okay. So I have one more question for all the panelists, and then we'll get to questions that you all have. But this really is the, you combined have such uh, experience in the, uh, in open source, in communities, in cross-community collaboration. What would you actually say um, are the lessons learned? Maybe just a lesson for starters, and we'll see how long this goes, because I know each of us has large-scale opinions on this. But what is the lessons learned about cross-community collaboration that you would want the Kubernetes community and the Cloud Native Compute Foundation more broadly to, uh, to take away from this panel? Uh, well, I'll start again. Kay. Why not? <coughs> I think inclusivity. One of the things, as community managers in the past open source projects, we really focused on trying to recruit code contributors. And w the lesson that we learned in the OpenShift world at Red Hat is really that it's much more than the, the folks that are actually going to write the code. It's the end users, it's the vendors who are running stuff on top of you, the service providers, the operators. It's a huge collaborative peer-to-peer -peer network that documenters. we have. Documenters. The documenters, yes, <laughs> don't forget the documenters. Anyone who can write, it's a wonderful thing. But to really look at this as a holistic community and not just focus on how can I get someone to work on this widget this week. You okay. Okay, you game, Michael? Yes, so um, I mean, as we have heard before, um, for us it was quite a good experience to open source one of our um, core IPs um, because I think one of the results was that from the community we gained a lot of experience on different use cases. Before that, we were mainly driven by um, customers. So there was a new requirement for a new feature, and this was really a point solution for this particular customer for this particular use case. But now, um, collaborating together with the community, um, we have many different type of use cases we have to take care for, and that's some sort of an eye-opener, because we are thinking about um, technologies we have not talked about before, and um, that's just a great experience. Okay. So, uh, one lesson from the OpenStack experience and, where, and how Kubernetes is different. Um, so, when, when the OpenStack project was started, it was owned by Rackspace, and and uh, we had a number of first movers that went into that space. We had like uh, startup companies that were forming around OpenStack, but the big players were staying out of the community until we, we pushed it to an independent body to own it. Uh, the situation with Kubernetes is slightly different because you already have big players coming because they want to be part of it even before the governance is fully um, independent of one particular uh, actor. Uh, but you still you still have a, lo a long way to go. You there is still a lot of 
large companies that will not get involved with Kubernetes until its, mm -hmm. the, its governance is clarified. So I totally agree that things have been done the right way until now, but it's most, mostly informal mm -hmm. and good intentions. Yes. And, and that step where you need to put that in writing will yeah. be interesting because that's where the, the, the devil is in the details. Like yeah, that, that has been a point already that, that has been a challenge is many large companies have been concerned that it was Google only IP and that's part of why we moved it, defined the, the foundation and moved it to the foundation and looked at the broader view, which I will let you offer us a broader view of Cloud Native Compute Foundation and or lesson learned. Or both. We can do this one too, I but we'll talk about... the question was, what do we want from cross-community collaboration? No, you did that one already. You did that. You missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can go back to it. What would you like from the Kubernetes community, Alexis? More contributions. More contributions, of course. <laughs> okay. So, what is your lesson learned then? Lesson learned. Um, I think I, I'll just say that we've been asked already by quite a few people why is there a need for another foundation um, when there are so many foundations? And the answer is because none of them have got it right yet. <laughs> so um, what we want is for people to help us to get it right this time. Yes. And to set up a foundation that is as lasting and as successful as Apache was for the 1990s era of computing. Now it is almost 20 years since then. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. So please come and help us to figure out what is the need for the next decade or two. Thank you. Yeah, the whole way that this this community broadly, technology community, um, works on a day-to-day -day basis, engages with each other, interacts is completely different from the way that we all did when the Apache Foundation was founded. That's absolutely right, and we need to sort of um, provide people help to make those practices um, simple, uh, automated, uh, supported, yep. all the good stuff. Yeah. That, and there is a lot of really good automation in the process now. So in some ways, it has been codified, but it really needs to be written down. Yeah. Which is That's an important right. distinction. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've started to see um, communities doing this the right way. In a lot of cases, we need to make sure that there is a, a clear space for this right way. Codified is a great word. Yeah. Yeah, one one of the things we did right at the at the OpenStack Foundation on the upstream side was to drive everything from from a gate centric perspective. So nobody merges code. You have to pass the test, deploy, mm -hmm. and we have this gigantic continuous integration system where uh, we basically deploy every single proposed change before and and run. I don't know how many trillions of tests we do uh, before it can actually get merged. And I think it's a great pattern. And <laughs> it's one thing that's missing from the Linux Foundation right now. And, and, and the Linux project is uh, you can merge code that breaks things because you don't have that body of that, yep. s that gateway to protect your tree from, from breaking stuff. And I think that's a pattern you, it, that should be central to, to the upstream side in, the, in any modern open source foundation today. So that's something we can bring to the Linux Foundation, because I'm pretty sure that that's the practice we have in place already in the it is, Kubernetes yes. world. To, to the extent that it occasionally breaks the merge queue, yeah. and we have to wait a while until we get it all cleaned up. It's Not that we've been focused on that for the last couple of yeah, weeks. It's a, a trade-off. It, it, it can be a frustrating experience, because it will slow you down in some pieces, but then we realize that everything that's, I mean, in, in a piece of tof software or a collection of projects as wide as OpenStack, we realize that everything that's not continuously tested is broken. Is, yeah, and yeah. It, if it's not broken, it will get broken really yeah. fast. Right. So it's, it's a good thing to have this test-centric, get-centric approach, even if that can be a frustrating experience, especially when you're uh, I, I agree completely. And it has really been an impetus for the community to draw together and um, and push at Google to say, we need to make this more transparent. We need to make this more accessible. The community needs to be able to participate in this in a more meaningful way. And so there's been a lot of effort on that. But now you don't need to push at Google anymore. You can push at the Cloud Native Foundation Call instead. Alexis. <laughs> That said, it's not a bad, bad thing to have Google because one of the things we have to do is try to get donors to uh, cloud infrastructure donors for to support our continuous integration system. So we have like Rackspace, OVH, Vexos, and a few others that donate cloud mm -hmm. resources for that gigantic continuous integration machine mm -hmm. to work. And so having Google and their their like cloud stuff 
to back your continuous integration, it's not a bad thing. But that gives yeah. us exactly one cl cloud provider, which we need more to make this a broader standard. So with the Cloud Native Foundation, we have Intel instead of Google. <laughs> they have provided, apparently, uh, don't quote me on this because it may not be completely accurate, 1,000 machines in mm. Las Vegas. They're not minnow boards, right? That we can run. They're not minnow <laughs> boards. That we can run stuff on, which is actually pretty amazing. I mean, if you've ever run an open source project, you get customers asking, you know, can you prove to me that this will scale to 50 machines? And you say, can you give me 50 yes. machines? <laughs> <laughs> but then you go, oh my God, how do we get 50 machines? And then mm -hmm. it turns out you can't. Um, we have a thousand machines that you can use for this stuff. It's amazing. And more specifically to Kubernetes, because we're going to keep bouncing back and forth on this, um, Red Hat provides a bunch of the AWS end-to-end -end testing. Yep. Uh, and I know that we are um, getting some Azure testing as well. And there, um, and of course, Google Compute Engine is where we do much of our, much all of our testing. Uh, there's also a bunch of AWS testing that is done uh, by Google as well. So. Yeah. Lots and lots of cloud providers that are important, and we want to continue to grow that. All right, so I promised, unless you guys have more lessons. No, we're good. I promised that we would do questions. So um, stand up, raise your hand, let me know if you have questions. I'll repeat them, and then we'll get the panelists to weigh in. This can be about lessons learned. Oh, oh, hands, good. OK, <laughs> let me go with you. Don't worry. That makes it more fun. <laughs> You don't have to. Well, no, but <laughs> that's why I'm participating in the project. Is right. I think this is a better model. But, but um, how, do you, how do you work that out uh, here? You know, do you basically, when do you say, basically, yes, let's put you in, and when do you tell them to come in? So let me repeat it before you jump in onto the microphone. Um, so the big tent v an inclusive foundation versus competitive projects. And how are we going to reconcile this in the Cloud Native Compute Foundation? How are we going to, um, how are we going to choose a path that is either um, anointing a particular stack or having the big tent? How are we going to reconcile that tension? Alexis, I bet you're just dying to answer this. That's true. I am. <laughs> Contain your enthusiasm, please. It's a target on your shirt. I don't think any foundation that has prematurely specified a stack or architecture has ultimately been successful. And for the CNCF, we are really in, you know, in nappies still. We're stumbling around the kindergarten. Um, so do not expect any stack that is published by the CNCF to be the final version. These are just ideas for feedback. The way that we'll handle that, I hope, is as individual projects. So if people want to take a leadership position and define a particular stack, that could be one of the projects within the CNCF. But that will not be anointed as the stack. It will be one person's view of the stack, or maybe a community view of the stack. Um, so it'll be like an, any other project. Um, precedent for this is actually pretty widespread. You know, Within the IETF, there are lots of different competing attempts to define the same thing. Um, Apache, which I think is a successful foundation, um, has, for example, uh, five or six different streaming projects right now. Um, ultimately, there won't be five or six in you know five or ten years' time. But in the meantime, they're innovating, so let them do that. And we will encourage the same mentality uh, rather than trying to be prescriptive. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. That also gives us uh, sort of the good actor version of this. And there are governance pieces that we're working on to um, make this more possible. As an example, the governing board, which is um, for the most part 
made up of people that uh, have contributed to basically seed fund this foundation, has uh, additional members for uh, for start or additional seats for startups and for um, for gold level. So it's not just the top level um, business businesses that want to move this foundation forward. They they have created a technical oversight committee which they, the governing board, have uh, nominated and voted on a technical oversight committee which has multiple project um, uh, luminaries from from technology uh, in the cloud native space. And that technical oversight committee then gets to nominate people themselves that they feel are not represented. There is also a seat on the technical oversight committee from the user community, the membership community, the Cloud Native Foundation. Um, for those of you not familiar, or you're probably all familiar because you're better educated than we are in the U.S., uh, with the three model of governance, or uh, sorry, the um, balances of the, th the three types of government in the U.S., so the House, the Judicial Branch, and the Executive Branch. Uh, we have a, a governance board. We have a technical oversight committee. We have a use end user board or end user committee as well trying to guide what, this, what these projects look like and how to make them go forward. Um, the, uh, as an example of how this um, is a broadly inclusive community, right now the Technical Oversight Committee is choosing their additional two members, but the first members that were seated, there are Apache Foundation members, um, founders of Mesos, we, we heard earlier, um, we have people from Engine Yard, you know, early, early container adopters and, and creators. There was not, for example, an, an initial seat on the Technical Oversight Committee either directly from the uh, Kubernetes team or from Google. So those are both seats that will likely, or the two seats the Technical Oversight Committee is filling will likely choose from those, um, from people in those communities because we want that broad big tent uh, view on all of this. The use end user membership is also going to be, uh, that member board is going to be seated from the broader membership of people who are using uh, cloud native application stacks, cloud native views, not all of which are going to be either Kubernetes or Mesos or etcd or CoreOS or Docker, and we hope to have this be a very inclusive project that talks about uh, services that are necessary for the cloud native uh, direction, not specific projects, but having specific projects work on finding what the right path is. I just want to add that it's an excellent, excellent question uh, because we've been struggling uh, within the OpenStack Foundation with that precise question over the six years and we changed our governance multiple times already. I think uh, the lesson to learn from those six years of experience is that um, if you don't have a very product-centric definition or mission um, and, and you have a broad mission, and I think that's the case of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, then it's really difficult to not adopt a more, uh, more of a big tent community type thing. Uh, what will bind you together, and that took time for us to realize it, is, um, is the community part. Mm -hmm. is, are you part of the community? Are you sharing the same goals? And are you, are you pushing to, toward the same, the same objectives? And at, once you accept that it's more of a group of of organizations that are interested in pushing in the same direction, it's really difficult not to be inclusive of other projects that have a slightly different view. Thank you. So I'd like to say what, what I think happens when you have a prescriptive architecture in a foundation. Um, you define an architecture and then there's a component like, let's say, networking, for example. And um, what will happen is other projects will be going on their merry way, trying to be high velocity, good quality open source projects, and then they'll get an email from the head of the networking committee saying, oh, you do not comply with our vision of networking. Are you aware that we are defining networking for this project? And they're like, you know, who are you? Why are you talking to us? Why, why, why do we need to listen to you? And then they stop working. And that is what happens when you have the sort of bureaucracy that comes with these uh, architectures. And that, I think, is something we want to avoid. As we continue to focus on the end user, the end use cases, and the needs of them, that helps us allow for innovation. It's really easier to answer the question, are you a cloud native, uh, part of the cloud native computing foundation 
community, then answer the question, is this project something that would fit inside? I mean, as, um, so I'm, I'm the chair of the technical committee for OpenStack as well, and one of the things we do is accept new projects, and our job used to be to decide if something was part of OpenStack or outside of OpenStack, and it's like an impossible task. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's so much easier to say, well, you share the vision, you're acting, you're, you're following our open development practices, then you're one of us, and who am I to, to like judge your project? Maybe it's a good idea, I'll just experiment with it, and we'll mm -hmm. see. Excellent. Okay, so before we rat hole on this one, because we do have a whole uh, c Cloud Native Compute Foundation panel tomorrow afternoon, you had a question, I believe. No, we've answered it? Really? That's awesome. Yes. All right, next question. Josh, do I get to harass you before you ask your question? Okay. Okay, so corporate contributors, end users, individual contributors. You want to field that one? Um, there are individual contributors. There are always um, individual contributors. Uh, the, the language for this is currently in the CNCF charter. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, corporate contributors get to sign a corporate CLA, which is actually quite good for a number of reasons to do with the Apache patent license in, the fa in that, in that uh, language in the, in, in the Apache license. Individual contributors simultaneously use DCO and sign an ICLA. We're in the process of trying to change that to just DCO, um, which we think for various reasons is better. And actually, Thierry, why don't you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> It, this year is better. Um, so uh, in, in the OpenStack Foundation, we have one third individual uh, representatives and, and like two thirds various levels of company involvement. Um, but that said, in the end, uh, in the, that tier of individual representatives, you end up with people that act actually working for, are paid to work for uh, uh, on OpenStack. And so, I mean, that's part of the, infrastructure software nature of it. You don't really have a data center in your home. So usually, um, so it has this more corporate oriented contribution base, but um, we still have in our governance, the, the individual contributors and the corporate contributors. And like you said, the, while the CCLA, the corporate CLA is, is actually something companies are actually very uh, interested in, uh, their attachment to individual CLAs is not so important, and managing individual CLAs is just just like a nightmare. So it's so much easier if you can skip that difficult discussion and go directly to DCO, because once you have these ICLAs, some companies that are attached to those ICLAs will just camp on that and will resist change, so it's easier to just drop it. Just in case anyone didn't know, DCO stands for Developer Certificate of Origin which is a model pioneered by Linux in the 90s, essentially saying, I have written this code, I'm contributing it under the same license as the license of the project, and I don't need to sign a contributor license agreement. So it's considered to be the simplest, robust framework for contribution right now. There's another component to this, which is the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So the Kubernetes uh, contributor agreements and the, the way you can Kubernetes handles uh, contributions at this point doesn't change, and we work to define what the the broader picture, as especially as we work to define what the broader picture is for the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. All right. Yes, you do have a question now. Excellent. Which elephant? Postgres. Pick. Yeah. Oh. I thought you meant Hadoop. I thought it was Postgres. Man, I thought it was going to be Mesos. Docker is a huge part. Behaving, behaving as adult. We are reaching out to Docker and embracing them. Yes. <laughs> so I think um, you know the CNCF aims to be a big tent. Um, Docker so is an actual platinum member of. Docker is a member of the CNCF the at a Compute governing Foundation. board level. Uh, for Docker, the benefit of the CNCF is the creation of a 
well-governed upstream ecosystem framework. So for example, one of the projects that is um, being probably put forward for the CNCF is etcd. Uh, Docker certainly recommend etcd for some parameterizations of their Swarm uh, product and some other things that depend on it. So it is in their interest that etcd is well-managed, well-governed, you know, neutrally held, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that is Docker's raison d'etre for being involved. Now, in the future, it may be the case that the CNCF is a good place for Docker to actually contribute code to as well. I think the jury's out on that, and it's really up to everyone to figure that out. But that should not be confused with the potential for you know, Kubernetes to be seen as competitive with Docker Swarm. That's going to happen inside the CNCF too. There will yes. be projects inside the, inside the CNCF which overlap. They do the same thing. Just like in Apache, there are six streaming projects. They compete with each other. Um, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. We, we're, we're building technology on the go. We don't have the ability to decide in advance who is the winner. I hope that makes sense. It goes right back um, to the big tent. Just to add to that conversation, um, from a networking side, we are treating uh, Kubernetes and Docker as equal citizen of the cloud world. So with the lib network, we do have the plugin interface. We can provide plugins for Docker. At the same time, we provide plugins for Kubernetes. And that's, from an open control point of view, not too big of a difference. Yeah, I mean, it might go even further than that. You know, everybody wants networking to work with Docker and Kubernetes. But actually, it's not only about lib network. There might, e even in the CNCF, a possible future is that there is a lib network project and a CNI project. Um, and they gradually figure out how to work together or not. You might end up with two standards. It doesn't really matter. The point is that people need to get working open source code that is well governed inside this tent. That's what we want. Next question. I haven't done much from this side of the room. We've really answered all of them. Now there's a problem. There's beer outside. Uh, I wasn't going to mention the beer. <laughs> I guess it's already gone. Okay, this side. Are we really done? Last call. All right, thank you all for joining us. This concludes the first day of KubeCon. <laughs> thank you, panelists. And yes, as Diane let slip, there is beer downstairs. So we will see you all.